So here we have a booting IMX6. Here the arm tech con. So who are you? I'm Kyle Fox. Uh, I work for Freescale. I'm the product manager for the iDot MX6 series. So what is the latest you can talk about on this? What are you showing? Sure. When we last talked, we had just introduced the uh, silicon we had for samples uh, back in June. And so since then, we've been focused on uh, getting our silicon validation, uh, working on our uh, development platforms that we have here, as well as our software optimizations for a variety of different operating systems, including uh, Google Android. Uh, we happen to be showing a demo of Honeycomb, uh, as well as QNX. Uh, Linux, Ubuntu, and a variety of other operating systems. And so we're focused uh, for the remainder of the year on getting us into uh, uh, to a point where we can go to production in the first half of next year. So th this is it. This is the Honeycomb. Yeah, what we're just to give your, uh, your audience a little bit of a uh, refresher on the 6X series so they understand the context of this demo. The, uh, the 6X series consists of uh, three processors. Uh, in the family currently. Uh, that's the iDOT MX6 Quad, uh, the iDOT MX6 Dual, and the MX6 Solo. And so, as you, as you might imagine, they vary by the number of processors. They're all Cortex-A9 based, uh, uh, running up to 1.2 gigahertz. The uh, family will also do uh, high definition video, so 1080p, uh, 30 and 60 frames per second decode for the Quad and the Dual. The Solo will do 1080p, 30 frames per second, uh, both on the decode as well as the encode side. Uh, we also have the ability to do, uh, we have what we call our triple play graphics subsystem. So triple play simply means in the six quad and the six dual, we in implemented three graphics controllers. Uh, one is a uh, quad shader architecture uh, unit for 3D, uh, 3D applications as well as user interfaces. Uh, a 2D accelerator uh, for 2D games, uh, flipping through images, etc. And an open VG uh, engine. And the reason why we did three of them at once is that it allows us to deliver a quality of service uh, to our customers and to their applications that uh, having only a single accelerator can't match. So for instance, if you're in an auto infotainment environment, and you want to have a high definition, high uh, quality 3D map uh, that's running in real time, but you also want to display the speedometer on a digital display. You don't want the uh, 3D mapping program to interfere with the performance of those dials. So if, you, if your dial says you're at 50 miles an hour and you're actually at 65, you're going to get pulled over. So that's an example of why three different uh, accelerators allow us to deliver quality of service as well as great performance. All right. So. You have a special app here in, uh, on Honeycomb. You can. Yeah, what we wanted to show, and it uh, uh, is, we wanted to show the performance, just the pure raw performance, um, pure raw performance of a uh, of the cores themselves. So what you're uh, what you're going to see is uh, applications that only use the cores. Now, some of these applications could use our accelerators, for instance. JPEG, we do have hardware acceleration for JPEG. We've chosen to only do it on the cores, and the purpose here is to show how going from single to dual to quad core gives you a performance boost. Okay? So do you click a start test, or what do you do? Yeah, let me just give a quick explanation of each, and then we'll do the whole demo. So this is uh, this fish tank uh, is a pure HTML5 uh, test application. You can uh, go and check out on the web with your own PC or mobile device. And really, it varies by the number of fish that you want to display. Again, it's not using an accelerator. It's purely on the uh, main processor. So uh, right now, uh, we're on uh, single core. So as you saw, I went from quad core to single core, and it slowed down a little bit to 13 frames per second. Up here is WebKit. So we, cre we uh, downloaded a, uh, uh, a very, very long web page, and we measure frames per second as well as scroll time. So how fast do we scroll, and how much are we presenting? How fast are we presenting? And this, which in the demo won't change, is simply we're decoding a JPEG, which is 1024 by 768, but resized. We display it and then we re encode it. So, and measure the frames per second. Each of these apps are unbounded. So, when we tell them to run, they will consume as much processing power as they can. So, let's see what happens. So, let's start test. Now, you may be able to see this little red line. Uh, that's going to show the CPU utilization of a single core. As you might imagine, uh, we're running at a gigahertz right now. It's consuming every ounce of processing power it can. Uh, the JPEG rendering is only at 0.1 frames per second. 
uh, which frankly, when you're having all these apps together, is not too bad for just pure software rendering. And then WebKit, uh, you'll have to trust me on the numbers, but we're scroll the scroll time through the whole display, uh, and we basically copy pasted a number of the same app uh, browser all the way through is about 280 seconds to scroll all the way through, and we're getting about five frames per second. So a gigahertz single core, what this is telling you is that you can get you know good HTML performance, relatively good. You can browse and you can do JPEG, and this is basically the guts of a web browser. So let's see what happens when we go to dual core. You immediately see that dual core gives you a boost on the performance of the uh, scrolling. We jumped up from about 14 frames per second to anywhere between uh, 18 to 24 frames per second on the uh, fish tank using the same number of fish, and we're now at 0.6 frames per second for the JPEG. Uh, for the JPEG. And again, we're decoding, presenting, and re-encoding. That's why the image doesn't change. Now, you can see that we are maxed out uh, on both cores, and we intentionally do that. We, want, we don't want to do any scaling. So let's see what happens when we go to quad core. Now, the very first thing you want to see is that our JPEG rendering jumped 4x. We're now at 4 frames per second. When we were at a dual core, we were at 0.6 frames per second. We're now at 4 frames per second. So that is a 400% increase. The WebKit, and again, you'll have to trust me on the numbers, uh, it is scrolling in about 15 seconds all the way through, and its frame rate is 60 frames per second. With the dual core, uh, we were doing only 30 frames per second and scrolling at about uh, 40 to 50, fra uh, 50 seconds. So we've cut the uh, scroll time by 50%, and we've increased the frame rate by uh, 2x. So we fully doubled the frame rate. And then the last one is, is that, if you remember, with the fish tank with dual core, we were hovering between 18 to 22. And with quad, we're going to be able to jump up into the 22 to 30 frames per second. And it varies based on how many fish are coming in front versus behind. And the whole point here is that, uh, by going to quad core, and you can see the different cores, and right now, quad, you know, Core number four is not being utilized because the threads that it was running is completed. Uh, but in general, the summary, and there it goes, it comes back up. We've increased JPEG rendering by 4x. We've doubled the frame rate on browsing. We've cut in half the scroll time. And we've increased the performance of the HTML5 fish tank by anywhere between 20 and 30 percent. Now, what's not being shown here is that. If we were to allow the system to do dynamic voltage frequency scaling, and we were to take this workload on a single core at one gigahertz, when we move to a dual core, uh, that same workload will drop a little bit below a gigahertz, but we still have to be at a fairly high product point to complete it. When we move to quad core, some amazing things happen. Uh, the single core performance, the workload, on four cores allows us to drop the CPU frequency to 200 to 300 uh, megahertz on each core, and we drop the voltage a full 200 to 300 millivolts. That is a huge decrease in the amount of uh, power being consumed for the same workload. So the full takeaways with the 6X series, especially for quad core, is number one, the uh, software and the operating systems, as demonstrated by Android, are fully ready for quad core today, out of the box. Number two, we get a huge performance boost going from dual core to quad core. There's an absolute huge benefit there. And number three, which is probably more important for mobile devices, is that we see a significant drop in the uh, amount of power consumed for a given workload because we're spreading it out on multiple cores, lowering the frequency, and lowering the voltage. And that's the secret benefit to why a quad core matters to auto infotainment for tablets, for mobile devices of any type, smart devices with batteries, as well as for embedded systems where maybe they're plugged into the wall, but they still want to be green and not consume as much power. So you said the software is ready. Does it mean Android is ready for quad core? As an example, so uh, you know, the, the good people at Google uh, working with Honeycomb uh, with us, the uh, uh, when we brought up, oh, sorry. by the way, that was not a crash. That was a yeah. user error. Uh, the uh, uh, Honeycomb, when we brought it up, saw all four cores the first day and worked perfectly. It saw all four cores and distributed threads correctly. So they're, uh, the way I would personally say on the optimizations is the operating system is already ready. Uh, and more importantly, and I think this is probably the, the, the last comment, is that um, quad-core does not require full multi-threading. There's a lot of concerns that says, if I don't have a multi-threaded app, I can't take advantage of it. And that's not true. 
So if you think about this in the context of perhaps auto infotainment, let's use that again. Everybody talks about tablets. Let's talk about auto. If this is my mapping program, and that is my speech recognition, speech to text program that I want to, you know, speak my uh, Twitter, at, you know, or text messages, and this is a console that's showing my speedometer. Each of these apps could be fully single threaded with no parallelism whatsoever, and they can be allocated to one core. The mapping program's on one core, and that would use GPU acceleration, of course, but mapping program on one core, the speech recognition on the second core, and the uh, speedometer on the third core. These could be fully single threaded with no optimizations, and you'll still get the same benefit. That's automatic. That is something that can be very, that can be, that can be automatic. Uh, for instance, the operating system, when it sees five threads, it will try to load balance them across however many cores are in the system. And so if you have five threads, it'll put probably one on one core, three and four, and that fifth thread, they'll, it'll find the right way to put it onto either one of those. So here in uh, October 2011, uh, and uh, it's here, it's for real, so. For real, running today, full silicon. Um, it does not need a heat sink. Um, this is running at full uh, gigahertz, and it is not, uh, it's not burning my finger. Uh, the uh, silicon is coming up beautifully within our labs, and uh, we're looking forward to a fantastic 2012 uh, when we are able to launch the product out in the full market. You said gigahertz? We are currently with this demo running into gigahertz, but we do support 1.2 gigahertz. 1.2, and how about getting higher? Well, what one do you the, need for that? The way I, uh, let me answer that question in a little bit different way. Um, the ability to drive for high frequencies uh, requires, at some point in time, requires you to do edits to the processor in terms of being able to allow the cores to go faster. That actually is great because you can speed up any core to very high gigahertz rates. Your trade-off is leakage. So those fast transistors that give you that 1.5 or 1.8 gigahertz leak tremendously. And so while you could, we could drive the processor higher, we don't think that's necessarily the right thing for, especially for battery-powered devices or even ones that are plugged in that don't want to just consume a lot of uh, horsepower. We have acceleration for video, for graphics, the triple play architecture. So we're able to offload most of that into the accelerators and the general purpose apps that run only on the cores uh, we think with quad core, as demonstrated today, we don't need to go and put a two gigahertz processor into the iDynamic 6 family because of the leakage problem of driving them so fast. How about uh, later in 2012, you might release faster speeds? Uh, you'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. The, what needs to be done to reduce the leakage? I will have to wait and see. There's, uh, there's known techniques, but we'll have to wait and see. So what is, what is the work that you're doing right now? Uh, at Freescale, what does what, what do you need to do? Like bring it up, uh, test the chip, put it back in foundry, and or what's what's the status right now? Just like any, uh, one of the uh, main benefits that Freescale uh, provides, one of the unique advantages that Freescale provides to the industry is because we are uh, number one in auto infotainment, number two in embedded, and we have a very good foray into the consumer market. Uh, especially the embedded and auto infotainment markets, they require uh, 5, 10, and 15 year uh, development cycles. When you put your car out there, you need to be able to do replacement parts for 10 years. So from the very beginning, there's three things that Freescale does, and this will help answer your question, is number one, we design our processors for long life, 10 to 15 years plus. Number two, we design our processors on day one to be able to work in the higher temp environments that are required for this. So for instance, a consumer device may need to go up to 80 degrees C. A auto infotainment, because you could be in Arizona, uh, needs to be able to go up to 125 degrees. We're one of the only companies in the world that starts that process on day one. So to answer your question, what have we been doing since June, is bringing the processor in, getting our software ready, and starting the qual process to be ready for those high temp environments uh, uh, you know, at, at the very beginning. And the products will be on the market how soon? Uh, we are sampling now to uh, specific early customers, and uh, we intend to go into production in the first half of next year. All right, so definitely before next Christmas. I mean, the Christmas uh, next year. I'm looking forward to be able to use iDotMX 6 based products uh, at Christmas uh, under my tree next year. But maybe already in the middle of the year? Uh, we'll have to let our customers decide what they're going to do. All right, thanks.